folks, it, was, it wasn't until I became an adult that um, I really began to appreciate what a church is. Uh, now, there are a lot of mission statements out there. We have one here at this church. But a church is calling, and this is across all denominational lines. A church's calling is fundamentally to make disciples of Christ. That sounds very simple in concept, but it is very multifaceted in execution. Now, with how transitory people are these days, that is, they move around a lot, the conventional thinking of how church is done has been forced to change, too. When I think about my experiences of church as a child, I realize that my church upbringing was fairly atypical. There was a time when a family would have the once reasonable expectation of settling down, right? That was the goal, where one or both parents would find work, stable housing, and live in an area for what could be decades. You see that so prevalent right here in Baltimore City, where a person could live an entire life never having left their neighborhood. Now, times have changed, of course. It doesn't really matter where you sit on the socioeconomic ladder these days, because when it comes to moving for work, that's something almost everybody has to do. These days, we chase jobs, and so too living situations. Now, years ago, the goal of most Americans was to find a stable job that you could hold on to long enough to earn promotions, and you'd climb higher and higher. And then one day, you'd retire. Now, it's kind of interesting. Maybe you haven't heard this. Modern guidance is to not stay in any one place any, with any one employer for more than two or three years, because research has shown that people net more income when they leave a company and work for a new one in a similar capacity than they ever would sticking it out. So needless to say, making disciples in this kind of environment is really hard. I mean, there are plenty of people still attending this church that have been here 30 years or more, and they can remember how things used to be inside the church and in the local area. And yet these days, congregations reflect the new work environment. Families are much more cautious about where they choose to attend. And if something doesn't seem quite right, they just do what they've become accustomed to doing. They leave to find greener pastures. Now, to the saints of a church, that is those long timers, that's a lamentable situation. It can be heartbreaking sometimes. But I think there's an opportunity here that I'd like to discuss with you that I hope is worth considering for you, something that was revealed to me as I studied the scriptures in the bulletin this week. Now, last week, we spoke about how Jesus called the children to him and what children could teach us about discipleship. Now, here in week three, I want to share with you what I've seen in the Bible about the faith of the mature and how critical their faith is to future generations of God-fearing people. Now, when I was a child in church, you know, even as a teenager, even as a youth, I didn't really think about how church was run. It wasn't important to me. It just kind of maybe what church was to me and my experience. And young people, as I mentioned last week, they're always thinking about what's next, you know? So it takes them some convincing to get them to pay attention to the consequences of forgetting the past or failing to understand how it informs our present. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've heard uh, of a young person that didn't know how to write a check. You ever run into that one? Yeah. Um, 
They could sign their name, but they couldn't write in cursive or handwriting, like a lost art, isn't it? Uh, they had no idea what the pound key was on a keypad. I ran into that in my last appointment, only last year. And I was like, oh, it's the hashtag. Oh, okay, boop. Right. Maybe they heard a song and thought, oh, that sounds like they're copying some recent artist. Like, oh, I heard Taylor Swift, you know, sing that last year when in reality the inspiration for the song was in fact much older. Now age offers two big gifts to people. Number one, in my opinion, the preservation of history. And two, a much richer, more informed present life. Now age makes information far more dense than one might read on the page, or here in the media. Age gives us context, you know, and with more age comes more context. That doesn't mean we always remember the past, of course, or honor it. But if we choose to be honest with ourselves, the memory of a mature person is one that understands the consequences of certain actions being taken in the present, because they've seen it happen before. In times when people didn't live for very long, or places today where the median age of the population is lower than, say, 35. Yes, there are places on this earth like that. Life will look very different than a place where the median age is, say, 65. Now consider this morning's gospel lesson. Traditionally, the story of Simeon and Anna is used a little closer to Christmas time. But I chose it to illustrate this point. Both Simeon and Anna were elderly. They both had their own perspectives on the state of ancient Judea, as they had witnessed the terrible changes that Roman conquest had brought to their homes. In fact, the author of Luke makes it clear that when they encounter Jesus, they see in this baby, only eight days old, something incredible, that the future hope of their people, the Messiah, the future foretold king who would redeem and liberate his people, heralding the end of the earthly age, had come to usher in a holy time where God would reign, not some oppressive monarch or foreign power. Now, Scripture says that Simeon was waiting for the consolation of Israel. And Luke goes further with Anna. Luke actually cites her lineage as belonging to one of the 12 tribes, Asher. To those who know the history that preceded this story of these two elders, this story is a culmination that moment in the movie where everything has been leading to the evildoer getting their comeuppance. To someone unfamiliar with the stories and the history, at the very least, they can appreciate, maybe even understand that, hey, there's something special going on with this kid. But what brought the Holy Family to Jerusalem was what had kept Anna and Simeon there as well, and that was tradition tradition. Anna and Simeon were frequent visitors of the temple of Jerusalem. They worshipped there. They observed the traditions. And Mary and Joseph, well, they probably didn't visit very much, aside from maybe the yearly customs of their people, as it was a considerable journey away from where they once lived. But before they had ever met Mary and Joseph, they went to church. They attended synagogue. They learned the history and the myths of their people. They heard the stories of liberation from Egypt, the establishing of their people as a kingdom, and in the midst of it all, the covenant that God had established with Abraham and Sarah to make of them a nation. They had received the law of Moses, and so, eight days after Jesus was born, according to law and tradition, they went to Jerusalem to present him for circumcision. 
And that was a symbol of that covenant. So when these two elders see this kid, they see this child, they realize that God has been faithful, that the God of Abraham and Sarah has kept the covenant, that their salvation has come. They have the benefit of hindsight, and God gave them the benefit of foresight. They knew what had led to this moment and had some idea of what God was up to. And both had a lot to say about it when they took their turn speaking to the Holy Family. Do you see it? Do you see the bond that connects them? The Holy Family and the two elders. It's a common faith, expressed in different ways, of course, but all bound together in the covenant that God had established with two other elders before Israel had a name. Now, there are many reasons people come to church for the first time. Some come after a crisis. Maybe they're seeking solace. Some come because they have children, you know? They, they hope that maybe learning about Christianity might help these kids be more uh, moral, get them started off right. Some come in search of a purpose. Some come because maybe they like the community, you know, the, maybe the music or just the general vibe. There are many reasons. The saints of a church, that is, those folks who've been there a long time and have benefited from the teachings of countless disciples, have a rich story to tell about the promises of God and what each person means to God. To be able to provide context to new disciples is the calling of God for the saints of a church. Now, what I'm about to say might seem a little controversial, and I do apologize for erring into the arena of politics. I won't be talking politics today, just something around it. Age is considered a liability in modern society. You see it playing out in our current election cycle, where two older men are vying for the highest office of the land. How many times have you heard commentators poke fun at their age? If you're a mature person watching something like that, how does it make you feel? Doesn't it feel almost self-indicting, as if someone is judging you? Like someone is maybe going to judge you about your age. I'm not frankly interested in debating the politics of the election, but I have to say, I am appalled at how each of the main contenders has had to go out of their way to convince the American public that their age isn't a liability. What does that say about the things that we value as a society? Since when did doing what you feel called to do become limited by your age? Anyone spouting that kind of rhetoric in church and frankly anywhere else for that matter should immediately be pointed to the story of Abraham and Sarah who laughed at God when God revealed their calling and established a covenant with them. Would we have a faith if they had simply said, no thanks God, we're too old. You see, God knows who God calls. God don't make mistakes. I sometimes lament my path, of course, because as a, as a pastor, my Christian history is far more generalized than that of the humble lay person who has been attending the same church for over 50 years. I have the benefit of many histories that don't belong to me. But what a blessing it would be 
to know God so intimately, to have witnessed so much change, some good, some bad, and know that God was there through it all. This is the blessing that the elders of a church can pass on to its newest disciples. They need to know that God can be counted on, that God is faithful. The young don't have the luxury of age to know any of that. They got to take it on faith, which is hard for a young person. So when someone who has been there, seen it, done it, talks to them about the wonders of God, it has an effect far more profound than that of any impassioned sermon or biblical teaching. Saints of the church, you have been blessed to be a blessing and you have witnessed firsthand God's faithfulness over many years. May the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob never leave your side. May your faith be an inspiration to the young. May your age speak of what it means to be in companionship with the Most High. Glory be to God.